from Dr. Prabir Pukraista on uh, free software and perspectives in uh, knowledge commons. Uh, human civilization has evolved for a long time as a never-ending process. It went through an array of many even and odd shape. And predictably, it took the current shape with the help of knowledge deep-rooted into it. The exploration of information and knowledge as commons are still in its early infancy. The traditional study of knowledge is subdivided into epistemic areas of interest. Law professors argue the legal aspects of knowledge in regard to the intellectual property rights. Economists consider efficiency and uh, transaction cost of information. Philosophers grapple with epistemology. Even Moglen depicted common uh, as active producers in a new digital economy with a hope that as knowledge penetrates all spheres of production, the most important common of all, our collective brain power will create a future of the human race very different from the property bound, hierarchically organized current mode of production. In 21st century Indian scenario, free software movement is providing an alternative to the traditional way of approaching knowledge. It is so, today we will get a glimpse of the analytical view on such issues from Dr. Purkaista. Uh, Dr. Purkaista is an engineer and science activist in power, telecom and software sectors. He currently serves as the vice president of free software movements of India, which is an umbrella organization of various organizations committed to promote use of free softwares in India. He has written extensively on a variety of science, technology, policy issues in several leading journals, including EPW. He is also an editorial team member and alternative uh, news portal called Newsweek. With this few brief uh, description, I would like to call, invite our uh, today's speaker, Dr. Gasna Stelic. Before Dr. Pukas uh, delivers his lecture, uh, I'll uh, invite our General Secretary Nikhil to come and present a small token of appreciation from our side to Dr. Pukas. I'm really happy to be with you today to discuss what is the primary purpose for which you are in this institute, which is to study, learn, and knowledge. That's basically what all students, all institutes are supposed to provide. So what we're going to look at today is really how do we look at knowledge today. As you've already said, that knowledge could be looked in different ways as an economic issue, how do you look at knowledge in the economy, you can look at it in terms of intellectual property rights or in terms of law, you can also look at it, look at, look at it philosophically. At the moment we are going to really do the first and the second. So if we look at knowledge, next, if we look at what is called the historical commons, this is something which was in the 17th century, 18th century in England. The people were being expropriated from the commons. What was regarded as something which people had access to was being enclosed. This is the, what is known historically as the enclosure movement. And they said that if you steal from what is the commons, then you are hanged. But what happens if you steal the commons itself? Because that was the enclosure movement by which land was being enclosed by the rich, the feudal lords. They were really enclosing land. And this is the common land. Now, of course, this is not something specific to England. 
because this is something that you have you, you, you see even today that you see the village common land being encroached continuously you see land is a is in India today a major bone of contention. You have tribal communities who are losing their land and of course you have urban land which has become really a huge real estate boom for some while lots of people are losing access to the land. So land has of course been one of the primary issues in terms of property and one of the ways of course it happens is when it is enclosed. Next. So if you look at the whole issue of commons, it might appear that it is something which is today new. It might appear that when you talk about free software, we are talking about science as science commons, and we are talking of something which is new. But if you look at it differently, you will see that commons is what we come from. That human civilization has really come from commons. The hunting gathering stage had everything in commons. The next stage, if you take agriculture which started without irrigation, a large part of it considered that land was available, that you had to, as villages you could go out, if you became too large, you cut some forest and you expand it. The commons also provided always, also in terms of crisis, it always provided an alternative source of livelihood. That means if that, that year your food, your crops fail, you at least have the commons to survive. So it is always an alternate economic system in some way which lived outside the economy which is agriculture, which is the primary economy or industry and in terms of prices always provided sustenance to the economy. So it is not something that commons was outside, something which is quite new. It always existed in the economy. And what we see gradually is that as private property grows, you, start, you see the enclosure more and more of this commons and you see conversion of the commons to private property. Now, next. Now, this property that has developed historically, did not develop without violence, of course, that property rights were established through really the state or the rich and the powerful exercising their violence on the people so that they could enclose the commons. And this is, it, it also had a whole transformation of law as, we, as it arose. You had artisans for us in England and England is well studied because we have access to English uh, literature more easily because of the colonial past. If you study the history of English law, you will see, for instance, the artisans had the right to, if they're given out, for instance, the wood, to make certain artifacts, say, for instance, building a ship, then all the wood that was left over was theirs. It was not supposed to be something which was theft. If you surplus wood was there after you had built the artifact that you were given the wood for, it belonged to you. That was the law in that terms. But when you take, for instance, their artisans becoming wage labor, then they don't have those rights. So the transformation of rights, as it evolved, economy as it changed, meant that certain rights got taken away and a new set of property relations got established. And this is what we see today as really capitalist relations of production that some people own the means of production and you have a working class which has wage labor and they don't really have any rights to the produce nor do they have any rights to the surplus that is left over that all belongs to the one who invests the capital. This is the modern capitalist economy that arises but it does not arise in agony, you know, as if it comes out from nothing. It really arises from existing commons which are slowly carved out into property initially as feudal property and later on as capitalist production. This is the history of why I'm giving all this is I would like to tell you that we are not talking of something which is some which is which has arisen de novo, but it's something which existed, which we're rediscovering in different ways. And of course when we do discover it in different ways, we of course do discover new properties that have come into being which we'll discuss. So if you really see this whole development, this is the old enclosure movement where physical property is being enclosed and privatized, private property is being created out of the commons. Next. Now when you talk about what we talked about earlier, the knowledge as commons, what happens? 
what we are seeing today is that the area of science and technological knowledge also being enclosed as private property. Now, if you look at technology, it's true that technology from the beginning was concerned more with a certain kind of property relations. Patents were something given very early in, in technological terms because inventors quite often would die without disclosing the inventions. So therefore it was felt that if you wanted inventions to be disclosed by the inventor, this is really again 16th, 17th century that we're talking, that we're talking about, then it was important that we give the state, gives a certain monopoly to the inventor so that he discloses the invention to the public. Otherwise, the invention would die with the inventor. So it was a public interest which meant that you give a patent to the inventor in lieu of which he will make the patent public. So it was more as much public disclosure as monopoly which enters into the patenting system. But technology to the understood could be the problem, could be converted into patents. Monopoly would be given for a certain period of time. Science was regarded as generally, all societies of that time, most of it today, is something that was not supposed to be done for profit. You could get a stipend, you could get a professorship, quite often in those times, even that was not possible. It was really that uh, those who had feudal property could become scientists. You have the whole history of sirs and lords who became basically practice science because they could afford to do it. But slowly as the institution of science grew, you could get salaries, but it was understood that the products of science, which are theories and knowledge, would be in public domain and they would be exchanged freely and there would be no property rights on the products of thought, science. This is the basic understanding of science which existed till recently. What we see today is that science also is starting to get enclosed and you are getting patent system coming into also production of knowledge as knowledge and profit and what generates profit is difficult to separate. A formula can give you billions of dollars. Now that formula therefore is it knowledge, is it a technological product? Those kind of issues are becoming difficult to separate. Is a, a genetic information? Is that information? Is it a code? Or is it something which is a product? So is it a chemical sequence? If a chemical molecule can be patented, why not a gene sequence? These are the kind of issues that have arisen and you slowly are seeing the development of science becoming enmeshed into this kind of production relations where property is being established at the heart of what would be called scientific knowledge. That's why I'm calling it really the new inclosion movement. And of course you have software which started by initially being talked of copyright. Now, if you really look at software, software doesn't last for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years. While copyrights generally are 60 years in India, some countries 50 years, in the United States 95 years. Now, if you look at all of this, software is not something that should have come under copyright because no software lasts for 95 years or even 60 years. But that is the only mechanism of intellectual property right protection that could be offered. It is either patents, industrial designs, or it was software, so it is or copyright. So it was decided to be copyrighted. But now, increasingly, the demands are in lots of countries that we also patent software, and even business methods are sought to be patented. Of course, the United States, there's recently a division of the court case on that. Well, and there some, some changes are taking place because US courts are finding the patenting system too, too much. They are saying it's really killing innovation and therefore there is a step back from the patenting system. But even in the United States laws as well as a lot of other countries laws, business methods can also be patented. So this is where it, start, it stands at the moment. I'm calling this the new enclosure movement because this did not exist in the past. If you really look at it, before 1985 or so, you could not patent either life forms or you could not patent software. Both of these in the mid-80s become patentable. And uh, both of this, the life form patenting as well as software patenting, in fact, interestingly enough, involves Indians because you have uh, the first 
the molecule, that particular uh, bacteria which could eat oil, that was patented by uh, an Indian and that, that went to the US uh, court, finally Supreme Court and he got the patent for that. And there is also the patentability of software came from a judgment from somebody called Mr. Alapat who actually also patented software and that was again a landmark judgment in the US making patents possible in software. So both of these, is, as I said, there's very uh, strange Indian connections over there. But the patenting of software and patenting of life forms is something which really arises out of the 1980s. Didn't exist earlier and you have a whole transformation of the scientific structure as well as of course the software industry which talks about patenting copyright in, in areas from gene uh, information to uh, software uh, business methods. Next. Now, what I am trying to talk about here is that when we talk about the commons earlier, we are talking of what is called the finite commons. That means land, water, air. Though it is believed and it was believed at that time that air was really infinite, that there was really no uh, bounds on the air we use. Of course, with global warming, we know that if we keep on dumping CO2 to the atmosphere at some time, you are exhausting the global ability of the environment to sustain. The, uh, the kind of globe that we have today and therefore obviously there are the, even air which we thought is infinite, the oceans which we thought were infinite are not really infinite and therefore they are all finite resources. But the, when you are talking about commons as knowledge, when you are talking about commons as software, now there is a completely different characteristic to it, they are really infinite because if I use the laws of gravity n number of times. The law of gravity doesn't change, doesn't get worn out. Therefore, when you use scientific knowledge again and again, they, this is really infinitely reproducible because there is no varying out of the property of the laws of gravity. Therefore, scientific knowledge is an infinite, infinite commons just as digital software is infinite commons as many copies as I make. The original does not get worn out. So therefore, here the other situation that you have a whole set of things which are infinite, infinitely reproducible, but they are treated as if they are finite. Why? Because it's a price you pay on that. Now, interestingly enough, if you think of it, music also has the same characteristic. If I reproduce music on a CD or I copy it onto my, uh, on my hard disk, n number of copies I make, the original doesn't get changed. So you have the ability today to make 100% reproducible artifacts of some kinds, particularly music, books and so on, which does not wear out the original, but we treat them as finite resources and we treat them with uh, the, the way we should be treating the infinite commons, the, fi the, the finite commons. The finite commons we treat as if there is no prop price to pay for using it. So we are using air, we are using water and we are using forests as if they are inexhaustible when they really are not. While those which are inexhaustible we are using as if there is, they are scarce commodities and therefore we have to pay a large price for using them again and again. Next. So this is what we talked about that when you talk of industrial waste you talk of emissions in the atmosphere, we treat them as if they are free, we can dump whatever we want, but knowledge, etc., we have to pay a price. Next. Now, if you look at the world today, the developing countries and the not-so-developed countries, what's the difference? The real difference is the knowledge they have. It is not that they are more advanced than us in abstract terms. They are more advanced than us because they have more knowledge than us. Therefore, they can create the next set of technologies required by society. They can create artifacts which we cannot create because we don't have the knowledge. So, the relationship between developed countries and developing countries is really the asymmetry of knowledge we produce, we have. And it's not just the knowledge we have. It's also the knowledge we produce and reproduce. That means their institutions today can produce new knowledge. Our institutions today, even today, cannot produce at the same rate. So if, even though we are advancing in terms of knowledge, we have the IITs, we have the various other institutions of learning in the country which do research, 
which do produce new knowledge. Nevertheless, the rate at which certain, some of the advanced countries are progressing, they are progressing faster in creating new knowledge than we are. So therefore, it's not just a question of a static, how much knowledge we have, but also how much new knowledge we are able to produce. And this is what gives a certain countries advantage over other countries in terms of development. And that is the crux of today, the global economy. The global economy today depends on how much knowledge you have. And the more knowledge you have, the more economically, the more powerful you are. And that is the shift that you have in the end of 20th century from the beginning of the, say, 19th or early 20th century, when manufacturing was largely static. It didn't change dramatically. Next 10, 15, 20 years didn't really change. Today, if you take electronics, in 18 months, the devices get obsolete. Why do they get obsolete? Because technology, there's a generation jump that takes place every 18 months. And that is the rate at which technological change is today taking place. And therefore, those who have knowledge, the ability to create the next generation technologies every 18 months, if you will, have an advantage over those who cannot create the technology. We are no longer in a situation where we can play catch up because catching up assumes the others are static. The others are not static. So I think this is the central difference today that knowledge is the economy, a very large part of the economy. And that is why the ability to create knowledge, of course, means that you have an economic edge over others. Now, there are two, here I will really touch upon these two aspects of knowledge. One is reproduction and the other is basically the creation. How do you create? And I will say reproduction has been talked about a lot of times. We talk about intellectual property rights, which are all reproduction rights. If you have a patent, the patent gives you a right to reproduce that technology, an artifact. If you have a copyright, it gives you the right to produce copies. That's what copyright is all about. But when you are talking about really production, and that's a key issue today, that production is basically the heart of what is the knowledge economy. How do you produce new knowledge? And therefore, if you have an intellectual property right regime, which affects the way you produce knowledge, that is an inefficient, if you will, inefficient mode of production of new knowledge. And I'll come to that, how that's really what's happening. I'll only start with one aspect of production of knowledge, that if you to look at the 20th century science, early 20th century science, next please. Uh, let's go to the next one. Ah, sorry, let me come back to the copyright issue. The copyright issue is an interesting one because, as I said, reproduction of uh, copyright. You see, copyright is supposed to be the incentive given to writers to produce. Okay? But if you look at the Copyright Act, it started as 14 years initially. Now it's 95 years after the person has died. Now, there is no incentive to, pro to produce once you're dead. Okay? So what is this incentive all about to production? It really is for the corporations to hold the copyright. Because as I said, the author of the copyright cannot get an incentive to write when he's no longer there. So essentially, this is the reproduction rights which the corporations today hold. And the, the Copyright Act in the US is particularly interesting because Disney holds a copyright on Mickey Mouse. Okay, And every time the Mickey Mouse copyright expires, the Disney moves the US Congress to extend the copyright. So from now, from I think it started with 60 years, now it has become 95 years, Mickey Mouse copyright still with Disney Corporation. Now, in India, strangely enough, it was Vishwa Bharati who wanted the copyright to be extended for Rabindranath's works. So that is why for 50 years it became 60 years. When the copyright was all expired for Vishwa Bharati, they again moved it should be extended to 70 years, at which point people said no. So otherwise, it was really originally 50 years. Only because of Vishwa Bharati and Rabindranath it became 60 years. Next. Now, th this is, we have already gone through this. So wh what is it that we are really incentivizing? Because after all, you incentivize people who are dead doesn't make much sense. But the interesting part of it is that what happens if you have this copyright is 96% of the books actually become dead books because nobody produces them. But the copyrights are still held, so you can't reproduce them. 
if I want to reproduce a book which is not being printed anymore, and as I said, most of the books are not being printed. Very important books are not printed anymore. If I want to print them, I violate copyright. But as I said, 96% of the books will go out of print. So what happens to all this? So these are issues when you reproduce, you hold copyright, the certain consequences. Next. So I have already said the copyright is really not of the individuals, it's really of the corporations today. Now, I'll come a little bit to the issue of patents, that uh, it's not a lot of the times we think patents are a great incentive for production of new knowledge. Except for pharmaceuticals, there is really nothing that patents help. Pharmaceuticals, yes, because pharmaceutical, the patents are well defined, they're a small thing, it's a molecule, so you can define the boundary well. And of course, you can make lots of money if you have a blockbuster drug. But if you look at any other area today, patents really don't help. And most big corporations are getting hit by what are called patent trolls. Those who have collected lots of patents are purely buying patents and then suing whoever is successful and getting billions of dollars in damages. So the big companies, and I'm talking of Intel's, all the big technological companies in the world today, are not in favor of patents, but they don't know how to get out of it because the system is already there. So that is the problem. Software companies are the worst off because they are getting, getting sued by huge, for huge amounts and their benefit out of holding patents is very small. So there have been a lot of studies done. The studies show that the cost of maintaining patents is far more than the benefit that they are getting as revenues except for the pharmaceutical companies. Next. Now there are certain Consequence, of course, for the pharmaceutical companies also, that whoever goes first gets a patent, gets a big drug, makes lots of money. And what happens is, of course, what is then the blockbuster drug? Those, for those who can pay, those who can't pay, there is no incentive. So you have, as I said, for the last 10 years, the three blockbuster drugs were what is called erectile dysfunction. And you have no new TB drugs for the last three decades. Why? Because the TB patients are all from poor countries, they can't pay. So there is this whole asymmetry of who can pay, therefore patents, therefore research, and therefore markets move into that area. While other areas where you have what are called the neglected diseases, not because the diseases are neglected, because the poor people have no purchasing power. Next. So if, you, if a drug goes off the patents, what happens? The price drops by 20 to 50 times. That's the rate at which the price drops. And if HIV AIDS drugs were not manufactured in India, which what the generics are still manufactured in India, if they were not, then the cost of treating patients in some of the African countries would have been more than the GDP of those countries. Why? India had earlier a patent act which allowed only process patents. By 2005, we had to give that up. And therefore, those generic, those drugs in India were not patented. They, you could have a different process to get the same drug. And therefore, the first generation of HIV AIDS drugs which came out of India were all therefore available at 1 50th to 1 30th of the price of the similar products in the United States or in UK. And that's why the African countries could get their AIDS medicine from India. And that's why they survived. Otherwise, you would have, you'd have a medical disaster of a major magnitude. And when it was happening, when the whole patent issue was being debated at the time, I still remember, people say, why do people bother? Most of the drugs anyway in the market are not patented because they've gone off patent, so it will not make much of a difference. And he said, hey, wait till the next disease comes, and then you don't have non-patented drugs, and sure enough, we had HIV AIDS coming after that. Next. Now, the issue that happens is, if IPR comes in, what happens to science? And this is the interesting issue that really comes up, that when you have science being patentable and it really comes into biotechnology. With biotechnology, heart of science becomes patentable because gene sequences in the US can be patented. Now, if that happens, what happens to science? What was an open collaborative exercise top speed? Because everybody is not interested in the patent. They are not interested in the publication. They are really interested in the patent. 
So you are not, if you, once you publish, then it's not patentable. Therefore, you don't publish. Therefore, science becomes far more secretive than the open collaborative exercise it was. Therefore, the way we do science is changing. And as you are seeing also diagnostic chemicals and reagents also being patented, the tools of research, this is my really for a lot of the biotechnology research, these are my tools. They also then become patentable. And if they are patentable, to use those tools, it might be. Also, I have to also say that the results of my research also, if it produces patents, I'll also assign it to the companies which is giving me these tools. So you get a whole chain effect that takes place and research stops being what it was. Now, why is it, why does it bother us? It bothers us because what it means is that science becomes much less efficient, if you will. Production of knowledge in this kind of way in which intellectual property rights become the determining influence means the open collaborative way of producing science then stops and what you have is a far less efficient way of doing science and this is exactly also the free software issue that when groups work over large teams openly then the quality of the product they produce is different if you take for instance what is the Higgs boson research there are 4000 people involved in the research there is, if the Higgs boson is found, the Higgs and boson may be names on it, but the actual people who will find it, their names will not be on it because you can't put 4,000 names on the research. Now, Dirac is supposed to have said that, you see, this is some conference in the 60s, that when he was young, a second grade physicist could do first rate physics. Today, even a first rate physics cannot do second second grade physics because the problems are so complex you need large teams you have to work together you need an institution which is which, which has these resources like the Higgs boson experiment the Hadron Collider and this means that the way of doing science which existed earlier no longer is possible and if you have science done with not in an open way but in a secretive way, it stops being modern science, it stops being what is the most efficient way of creating new knowledge. Next. Now, if you look at innovation as it existed earlier, then you had initially what are called the, in, in, the inventors, lone inventors. After that, you got really most of the lone inventors died. They didn't exist anymore. And you had this being done in really in large research laboratories, which are industrial research laboratories. It was Siemens, it was General Electric, it was the Bell laboratories which produced so many Nobel, Nobel laureates. This was the model which existed in the late 20th century. Today when we are seeing, <coughs> you will find <coughs> even this model is no longer available. What's happening is you're getting really large scale science being done across laboratories with large groups working together, the Higgs boson being an example. And what it's no longer possible for science to be done in this particular way. Next. As I said, the last lone inventor was Philo Farnsworth. I don't know whether you know. He's really the, the, the one inventor of the television. And we hardly hear his name because the company RCA fought a major battle against him on patents so that he would not get assigned the right to television. And that was, and the man really died virtually in penury because he could not get the right to television, which is what he had dis they discovered. But that's not very different. The, 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 the RCA as a company did that too. Also, Armstrong was the inventor of the FM radio. They did almost the same thing to him. And in fact, he committed suicide by, I think, jumping after this, he could not get his technology out. But finally, he committed suicide. So these are the, these are the people who came up against corporations. And the corporations that that time started owning the research. The lone inventor era was over. Today, next, today it's no longer possible to do science even in research laboratories of the scale of Bell Labs or General Electric and so on. You'll find they've dismantled the laboratories and most of the research is being done in public institutions. It's no longer the, I, I work in the industry quite, quite a bit I and mean, I'm a part of that. And I can tell you that the structural change that has taken place is all the research labs that existed in the industries today are no longer there. 
All of them are funding essentially institutional research in the laboratories of the public institutions like IITs and so on. And private research laboratories that exist in the corporation don't exist anymore because it's not possible to do research in small groups anymore. That's the real reason, that, that's a real change that's taking place. So what we are getting is really large groups doing research. And if science becomes a commodity, what is really happening is instead of science becoming public good, which is what it used to be, and it still is by virtue of the fact that the major investment in science still takes place in public institutions, it's sought to be privatized by some grants which are coming from the private corporation. So you're very, we have a very strange phenomenon that public science is sought to be privatized. It's not true for only India. India is a very small player in this. It's really true in the US where 90% of the funding is really coming from the government. But the 10% funding that the industry gives to it helps to private as the products of science because the US believes that's the only way it can strengthen its corporations to keep its economic dominance in the world because manufacturing in China has taken over. That's off. The United States can no longer compete. So the only way it can compete is if its corporations hold the public, the knowledge, knowledge as private property, then as they can live off that intellectual property and this is today the real battle that's going on. Manufacturing is no longer something that at least the major ex-manufacturing countries can cling to. As I said, the global hub of manufacturing is gone to China. Next. Now, if you look at what public domain science was, and John Salt when he developed the polio vaccine, he said, you know, I would never think of, you know, patenting it because it's like a patenting nature. It's like patenting the sun. But today, that's 1955, today, 90% of the biotechnology sciences would never say this. So this is the change which is taking place also in the production of science. As science has become more, demands on science has become more open and collaborative. At the same time, your privatization of science from public goods. So it's a very strange phenomenon we are seeing, which I believe really can't last. Next. So all of you really know about free and open source software by now. Linux is a very, new Linux is very uh, popular. It started as something which was 10,000 lines of source code. It's 20 years back. Today, something like 2,400 million lines of source code. So that's that is a thing done about two years back. So if this has been done on a model which is open and collaborative, people work together to develop this huge piece of software, proving that it is possible to have an alternate model of production today than what has existed hitherto. And I think that's an important point I'd like to make. That we're not talking about just this free and open source software. We are talking about a huge industrial product product called new Linux software operating system, which has 2004 million lines of code and the 204 million lines of code. And this huge exercise has been done without a company, without salaries being paid. About 4,000 4, people from different parts of the world working together using the internet, exchanging software without being in a cooperation. So you have different models of development which is possible not only for software, and that's really the issue, but for a whole bunch of other things. Next. So I would say that we are back to, we are calling it the new paradigm, but don't forget, this is the paradigm of science. Science always was like this. In technology, it's a new paradigm. But for science, it is almost open and collaborative. It's only now that we are thinking of doing it differently. So what we are talking about is that if you do get collaboration, would it not make the development of new knowledge far more efficient? And I would argue that there is no other way science can really develop. This is the only way science can develop. And attempting to privatize scientific knowledge, trying to privatize knowledge, is an exercise that is not going to last. Okay, last for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, not going to last. The same way as today, free and open source software is replacing bit by bit. It is replacing proprietary software. Well, 20 years back, it was unthinkable. Next. So, with very small examples, I'm not saying they're huge examples, but already you can see, CSI decided that there is no way it was going to get tuberculosis medicine and India still the largest killer is TB. No big drug company is working on it. So the only way it could do it 
is if it put, put, put forward an alternative paradigm of doing drug discovery. And there, this is something, open source drug discovery model in which students to researchers from across the country, even other parts of the globe, are collaborating to do an alternative way of drug discovery. Of course, there are two stages to it. One is what is called in silico, where you can do it through computations, and after that, you have to do it in life form. And that, of course, is takes money, takes effort, and it has to go to a certain cycle. Now, I'm not going to get into those issues in here, but it is true that they have realized that this is the only way they can get into drug discovery in a major way. And then we have what is called open source biology. Again, if you go to the net, you will find examples of it where they have said how biology could operate like open source software. And it is a different model where if you patent, you use the patent, develop something more, then you have also to provide that patent into a patent pool, some, something like this, by which it is available to others. The whole argument of Jefferson who pioneered this is that there is no other way we can reach biotechnology to the farmers in the developing countries. Therefore, this is the model that has to be made. If you make biotechnology the product of Monsanto's, GM, etc., the product of Monsanto's, it will never, never reach the farmers in a big way. And therefore, if you really want to deliver science and technology advances in agriculture, you have to take open source biology as a model. And I'm just saying these are all initiatives. One may disagree with it, one may agree with it, one can discuss it. But the new models of doing science are also rising. You have what is called a tropical disease initiative, which is very much like the open source drug discovery model that CSIR used. There is also, again, an open collaborative venture like malaria for developing the same argument that no big drug company is doing it. The different models on which these are moving, but the interesting part is alternative ways of doing science are being talked about and actually being practiced. It's not just being talked about. People are working together in different countries, trying to build medicines in a different way. And I think that's a very interesting exercise that's taking place next. So we are really talking about creating knowledge differently. And that, I think, is the crux of the issue, that it is possible to create knowledge in a different way today. And it is possible to do it, if we don't think about intellectual property, then it is possible to think of creating knowledge differently for society, for the good of society as a whole. I would also suggest that the IPR system today is obsolete with the way science really needs to be done. I'm not saying it because IPR will die tomorrow, it won't. But essentially, if you talk to any advanced technology company today, except the pharmaceutical industry, if you talk to any of them, they'll all tell you in private that patents are a big hindrance to our development. I'm talking of interests, I'm talking of you know the major technological companies in the world today. Talk to them in private, they'll tell you patents are a hindrance to our development. We don't like it, but what do we do? We can't help it. It's there, so we're also forced to participate in it, but it is something which is not helping us. Only example, only exception is the pharmaceutical company. Next. Now this is, as you had said, Evans' famous statement, what happens when active commons becomes a producer? And it's not only the question of biological products, medicines, not software, but start thinking, what is it that goes into any artifact, whether it is this microphone, so I'm using any artifact. It's ultimately the design knowledge that is embodied that gives it its cost. Not the raw materials that gives it its cost. Most of it is manufactured today in descaled small production units. They aren't manufactured in large vertically integrated factories or the Ford Motors variety. So what distinguishes what you would call the both speakers from other speakers is the design knowledge that goes into it. If that becomes open source, what happens to production? What happens to the economy of the countries? What is it possible to do then? That, I think, is a real active commons we are talking about. And I believe that, not in my lifetime maybe, but the next, in your lifetime, you will see, this is the dominant model of production that would emerge. And what it would enable is a society where knowledge is, at the act, is accessible to everybody. Of course, it means that you'll have to do away with illiteracy, you'll have to do away with ignorance, you'll have to invest in education, and as, next, 
as the struggle would then shift, as I said, what's the terrain of struggle? It would shift on the commons, private property versus commons. It's not that I'm talking about doing away with corporations tomorrow. That's not the issue for me. But it's the alternative, alternative model of production, which would slowly overtake the entire economy if we could bring knowledge as commons. That's, that's the issue. And Evans, this is famous, Evans words next, that how many Einsteins, he asked me this question when we were discussing, as to how many Einsteins do not learn physics in each generation? How many Einsteins are there in each generation who have not been able to learn physics? What if they really could learn physics, all of them? What would happen to human society? I think that's a good thought to end with. Thank you. Questions uh, as a continuation of this uh, of very good lecture, informative lecture. So, uh, some of the speakers, last question, ask one more. On the subject of internet commons, I guess, uh, we have uh, these academic journals that. Uh, uh, basically, um, spread the knowledge that the research has um, developed. And so, right now, under this current model of academic publishing that we see, we have uh, the publisher, I guess, we are speaking here and uh, they hold the copyrights for uh, the research that is done by someone else. So, do you think that a revolution in this area is possible? Like, we had a software, and uh, what, should, what can we do about it? I think that's a very interesting. One it's an interesting issue that I didn't really touch upon, which is the issue of open source publications, open source journals. And it's very clear that scientists who produce the knowledge which goes into those publications, of course the money is made entirely by the publications, Pennsylvania and so on. And for most research institutions, it's a huge cost. Now, of course, the open source publications also are costly for the ones who publish. So it's not that it is easy to do it either way. But it is definitely bringing up the alternative model that if we do invest in open source publications, and I think it's really, again, institutions who have to do it, then it is possible to do away with scientific publications by which at least most of the developing countries' institutions cannot access the children. And therefore, whole new paradigm of open source publications is coming up. And I have really no doubt that it's a matter of 10, 15 years, you will see a complete change in the way you look at science, science publications. In fact, if you know that uh, some of the advances today in sciences, people are going straight to the internet and putting it over there. They're not waiting for, it for publication, mainly because they feel it takes 12 month cycle for the journals to publish their research and they would like a faster exposure of the research. Of course, there is also a problem. How do you distinguish between bad research and good research? And the journals were gatekeepers in that sense. But it is also true, as gatekeepers, it is also true that a certain group of countries, institutions, were publishing much more than others. And it was not necessarily due to quality alone. So I think that this, this, this change is going to democratize uh, the publications of science in some ways. But yes, the difficulty as of today is open source publications. As an author, you have to pay a large amount of money because you are bearing the cost of the journal in, the, in that sense. So that is the, that's, a, that's a problem today. But I think it's a matter of time. And you are going to see soon that open source in the next 10 years, I think that's within my lifetime, we're going to see a complete paradigm shift in the way journal science journals are being published. Sit here. <laughs> Sir, thank you for such a nice talk. My question is that uh, when a person invests uh, very important time of his life 
or brings uh, his working life and he discovers something, he innovates something. And if he is not efficient enough or he is uh, not interested in production or some industrial uh, technique to industrial part, so how it will be justified? Means if we don't go for the patent IPR system, we abolish it. <coughs> then how will justify the contribution of that individual? In uh, when someone take this idea and uh, just make billions and he couldn't get anything out of it. So how we can justify that? You know this whole argument that the one who produces the idea really makes the billions. It's just not true because all of us who work for companies. Whatever work, work, work we do, the patent belongs to the company, not to the individual. So, you know, this whole issue is, do we really work for a salary? Do we really make the millions? That's, that, is, that, that is the issue that, in straightforward economic terms, that's not what is happening. But I'm not going to that. Let's look at it differently. What is a patenting system? Patenting system means whoever does the last mile, he gets a benefit. So you have a chain of discoveries taking place. The person who comes in last and can make it into an economic product, he makes the millions. Is that a fair system? I'm not going to comment on that. That's again something that people can debate over. But the real issue is none of this. The real issue to me is that scientific discoveries as individuals making discoveries is no longer the way discoveries can be made. Today, you have large teams who make discoveries and major there to assign what I said, individual inventors is a 19th century concept. Today, in 21st century, you are less like, less and less likely to see it. So, when the inventors die, you have the research laboratories which held the patents. Today, you are not even seeing the research laboratories in existence because you need even larger teams. So the really issue I'm proposing is not that I don't want to make the person who makes a discovery a great man, you know, uh, A, B or C, but it is not the way science can be done today. That you are not going to get, as Dirac said, the first rate physicists, physicists cannot do, even second rate physics today, because he needs a large team to do physics with. I think that is the change which I'm talking about. And therefore the idea that a person can make discoveries is a fallacy today. An intellectual property system which is based on the idea individuals make discoveries, which is true for 17th century, 18th century, 19th century, is no longer valid today. So that was really my point that I'm making. And don't forget that scientists never made money. Okay? They got name, they got fame. Did Einstein get lots of money? My, I think, you know, Bill Gates made much more money than Einstein would have ever made. But I don't think that was the issue for him. So each person has a set of goals in his life. And for scientists, it has always been making discoveries for getting respect of others and so on, and not for making money. And if and they did damn good science while doing it, too. So this whole idea that they cannot do good science without getting money is also something we need to think about. But as I said, I'm not thinking about all these issues. I'm really saying simply the production of science by which one person makes discoveries is no longer a viable alternative. It's not a viable model of development of science. That's really what I'm talking about. And that's true for technology as well. Good evening, sir. Uh, I have some uh, two questions here. First is that uh, you said that in 2005, media uh, Change the patenting system and somehow we were forced to change it. So why that happens, I'm not aware of it. And second question is the way the public is happens. I belong to one of the uh, public research uh, organization of our country, and I see more and more trend is that uh, it's also more of a popular opinion also that uh, private industry do better work, they're more accountable in that sense. So it's better to close down the government R&D institutions, privatize them and send it to private companies they can do better. Uh, how do you feel like, is it correct which I am being part of it, I can see that uh, most of the person who are taking such decisions, they do not understand the complexity involved in the R&D and they do not accept the failures there. So isn't that uh, we are also kind of going in this uh, 
US kind of model and where uh, all the decision makers are not able to make a great decision. Well, you know, there are two, I think there are two very interesting questions. One is, of course, a simple historical one. In 1995, we signed what is called the TRIP segment. It's a part of the GATT uh, WTO uh, debate that took place. WTO got formed and there was a TRIP segment was signed. And the TRIPS agreement is trade related intellectual property rights. That's the TRIPS agreement. And in that we agree that within after 10 years, within 10 years, we shift from process patent into product patent. We had till then only a process patent issue. Uh, we, uh, till 1995, India only used to issue process patents. It did not issue product patents. This came about because of, in fact, it's an interesting issue, that it came about because a study done by a Senate committee of the United States found that antibiotics prices were higher in India than in the United States in the 50s. This is a 50s uh, Senate committee. Then the Indian government started thinking, why is it so? And then the finally came up with the product, the product patent regime they abolished and they instituted what is called the process patent. And as a result of process patents, a number of CSI laboratories pioneered molecules which were done, same molecules were produced through a different process. And therefore, the whole brand back system plus that you see at the drug companies today, all of it came up under the process patent regime. And they became big companies. And they have become what is called the generic industry in the world today. And to, by, because of the TRIPS agreement, which we signed, unfortunately, India could have resisted it, but finally it agreed to sign. If India and Brazil had resisted it, which it was doing earlier, the probably the TRIPS agreement would never have come about. But unfortunately, we agreed to it, we signed it, and that's why in 2005 we had to change from the process patent. We had a 10 year, uh, what shall I say, uh, bold period in which we could continue with the process patent, but after 10 years we had to, we had to change to product patent. That's what happened. And if we did not, then we'd come under WTO sanctions. That's the reason that we have to finally uh, agree to the change the product patent, uh, go and sign the product patent regime. The second question you are asking is a very interesting one because in the United States, the research laboratories, as private research laboratories have actually ceased. If you take, for instance, Westinghouse, you take General Electric, you take Bell Labs, the biggest. Bell Labs is the, the private research laboratory in the world. All of them have become disbanded. They don't exist anymore. In fact, the interesting part is in the West, the research laboratories as part of large industries are slowly being dismantled and they are no longer in existence. In fact, research is done in public institutions and small companies do entrepreneurial work to convert technology of the public institutions to something which is produced in the market. Big companies do not produce innovation. That's sort of worldwide accepted. Big companies protect their share of the market, but they don't, do not really do innovation. Innovation is always done for the smaller companies. But the interesting part is industrial research, big time industrial research which existed in the second half of the 20th century, at the end of the 20th century starts getting dismantled. And it's really the public institutions of science, the MITs, the various other public institutions in the US, the Cambridge, the Oxford, if you will, those are the institutions today which produce the bulk of the scientific and technological research in advanced countries. It is not coming from private research laboratories. So those in India who say we should privatize science are not looking at the United States. That's my problem. They are basically propagating. You see, we should understand one thing. I'm quite happy if we do what they do, not do what they say. They say you should do this, but they do something different. So our decision makers here would like to do what they say, not do what they do. That is the problem. I worked in Westinghouse for a small period. That's why I'm saying all of this. Okay. I looked. My brother used to work in Bell Labs. So now I'm looking at all this from virtually from the inside. I've seen the dismantling of the research laboratories in these places. There are a few instances of uh, patent, uh, patents, uh, I'm not sure if they are software related, where a company uh, gets a patent, but they choose not to exercise the patent. Would you like to see this trend catch on or is there some hidden evil theory? Well, you know, the patent is a very interesting thing. Uh, 
question is if you don't work a patent, it is possible, it is possible then to make the patent void. That's possible. It's also possible for us to say, okay, he's got a patent, he's not working it, it can be compulsory license, compulsorily licensed. But those are really not areas today that I want to touch upon. The legal protection that can be exercised, provided the government has a will to do so. It has shown some will by now compulsory licensing a particular drug, which was recently compulsory licensed. So some will is there, but as I said, we really this is the will that needs to be exercised. Yes, law allows for compulsory licensing if there is the product is not being worked. Or the prices are too high, both. The last question for that Oh, may, may I ask a couple of questions, quick ones. The first one is uh, like uh, LGPL or GPL license, no public license. Could you, is there a possibility which will enforce or uh, uh, rather say, which ask the inventor if you are putting up a patent, okay, in, it's in public domain, but any other work derived from this also has to be in public domain. Is there such a possibility in legal terms which we can look for? That's one. And second is um, kind of a rather philosophical one, or not exactly. Uh, I'm taking a devil's advocate stand, especially from a libertarian point of view. Like uh, there is anecdotal or rather empirical evidence that uh, societies, by and large, were, uh, were strict private property laws existed are more prosperous than. <coughs> Like it's their argument. So when you see USSR or uh, China, Cuba, these countries, uh, the prosperity of people are in inverse relationship because they hold more, most of their properties or they are supposed to hold it for them. While the countries like US, where there are strict private property laws, they are much more prosperous. How would you react? Well, the second question would need another one hour lecture, so I don't think I'm going to get into it very easily, except to say one small comment, that you are really talking about historical uh, experiences which are very different. Soviet Union when it became a socialist country, it was a very backward country at that time. So it was a largest regime, it was a very backward country. In fact, the levels of poverty in Soviet Union and Russia at the time was comparable to India, which was again a very poor country. And of course, it became poor because of colonization. But without getting into that, so the historical experiences in that sense are not very comparable. And secondly, if you look at the other prosperous countries like Germany, England, and so on, by the libertarian standard, they're socialist countries. So that way, there would be a difference of opinion at that level. But I'm not getting into that today, because really this is not the subject of my... Uh, uh, what you've said is an interesting issue. Can we use patent the way new licenses have been issued? Is a viral patenting possible? And Cambia, the BioForge Cambia experience, they are trying to do something quite interesting in that. They basically are saying, I have a patent. You can use it to develop further patents. But if you do, then you have to put it under the same license condition which I'm doing. So, and then they make a distinction between private uh, you know, use of the patent, public use of the patent, and so on. So, legally, yes, because I am the patent owner, I can give it to you under any license condition I want. So, I can introduce license conditions which force you to do what I am doing. That's theoretically and legally possible, but it has not yet gone. So, that's very interesting at the moment. Unlike the free and open source software, which has really spread in an enormous space, this has not really spread. And the various reasons for it, why it is more difficult, partly because uh, it, it's not just the knowledge, it also means it has to be, there's a lot of, there's a large cost, unlike software. You produce it, it works, it spreads. But here there is a difference between a patent and then being able to use it in practice. And there's a large cost associated with that. And I think that's the, unless you break that, we're not going to see the same effect that, like the GPL, we're not going to see a similar kind of thing. I'm sorry, I really have to finish with this. Many, many thanks, sir, uh, for this eye opening lecture. Uh, that all of us to get a better idea about this.
add. Uh, before we call it a day, I'll, I'll request uh, from EML team Deepak to uh, give a small token of appreciation to work on this.